Welcome to Bible 201, Introduction to the New Testament. This week we are studying the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first of four Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The order of the Gospels um, is something that's set by the church. It doesn't have anything to do with the age of the Gospels. Uh, it's sort of a determining factor, it, uh, various things determined. It's the, the ordering of the Gospels. Some of it has to do with the use, uh, particularly the, the Gospel of Matthew was very much in use in the early centuries of the church, used in uh, readings each Sunday. Um, and so it, it found itself in the first place of the four Gospels. And um, so we're going to look at it. It has some interesting things about it that make it different from the other Gospels. Um, we'll focus this week on the teaching of Jesus, um, the message of Jesus as, as, as um, presented by the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, again, it has some differences to it. Uh, than the other Gospels. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll, in the Gospel of Mark, we'll look at some other things in terms of the ministry of Jesus. And, and when we look in the third week with the uh, Gospel of Luke, particularly we'll focus on the, the passion narrative, uh, the death of Jesus, and the uh, thing, events surrounding that that's presented by those Gospels. But again, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, in your uh, readings, for this week, uh, you were to read uh, in our uh, chapter, uh, uh, our two books, uh, Warren Carter and Amy Jill Levine's The New Testament Methods and Meanings. You had some readings there on the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I particularly want to focus on your readings in the, the shorter readings that occurred in the Jewish Annotated New Testament. Um, I'll remind you again that each week we'll, you'll have a quiz, a weekly quiz, and that quiz will be focused on the content of the, those introductions to the particular New Testament books. So it's an important thing for you to look at those carefully. Usually it's only two to three pages. Focus on those. Make sure you have a good handle on them before you uh, sit down and take the weekly quiz. Uh, Aaron Gale talks um, in there in his discussion something that is in more depth. We get in Carter and Levine's uh, treatment, and that has to do with the sources of the gospel. That's something that scholars spend quite a bit of time talking about. How are our gospels um, created? Where do they get their information? Um, the, it should be said, actually, is that none of our gospels are signed. Uh, none of our Gospels uh, come with their names on it. Uh, the, the name that appears at the beginning of our printed editions uh, is something that is added by scribes. It's not, no one signs their Gospel like Paul does in his letters, where he says, I, Paul, write this letter, or he begins the letter, Paul, the Apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, none of the Gospels... Um, actually have the names of the evangelists on there. The, the identity of the authors uh, has been something that's been uh, given by Christian tradition. Oftentimes there's very good reasons for it. There's evidence for it. Uh, so it's not that they just picked it out of the air willy-nilly. But again, it's something that you need to always bear in mind that the authorship of the Gospels is something that is part of Christian tradition and not actually comes out of the text itself. Um, having said that, again, there's there's always a question in terms of where the go particular Gospels gets its information, uh, the differences and similarities that exist between the Gospels. Sometimes two or three of the Gospels will um, will have material that's very similar, sometimes identical. Other times they'll differ, and so there's there has developed over the centuries. Uh, an attempt uh, to look at and try to understand where, how they compile this material. What are their sources? What are their historical sources for that? Uh, we generally assume that none of the gospel writers uh, were eyewitnesses. Uh, they don't seem to write in that vein. 
Um, and even Luke, Luke is quite clear when he tells us that they, um, he tells us that he, that others have, have told the story in the first four verses of his gospel and that he's setting down in a sense to reorder and put it in a proper order. So there probably were more than one life of Jesus, uh, people who had written accounts of the life of the Lord, maybe collections of his sayings. Um, and today, the, probably the, the most common uh, theory regarding the relationship of the Gospels and the sources behind our Gospels uh, is referred to as the two-source um, two theory. And that is the assumption that Mark is the oldest um, that was the first gospel, the oldest gospel, uh, and that uh, then that there was a, another collection of sayings uh, that in German the word is quella, but it is shortened. They referred to it as Q. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about the Q document. Um, a Q is a, just a hypothetical document that we don't have. We don't have a document in hand. There's no. Um, there's no certain evidence that it even ever existed. Uh, the The idea of Q has been uh, began in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it grew up side by side with uh, Mark's gospel uh, to explain why there are times when Matthew and Luke have material. Generally, it's assumed that Matthew and Luke are using Mark in the writing of their gospels, uh, but then it's they have to explain how is it that there are times when Mark is not clearly not the source, in other words, there Matthew and Luke are re recording material that Mark does not have, and um, they are identical. They have verbatim, same wording, same pa uh, same sayings, uh, same narrative, and the suggestion is that they had another non-canonical source. Again, it's referred to as Q Quella. Uh, I. I would venture probably 95% of New Testament scholars uh, embrace that approach. Uh, I will say that I do not. I am in a minority in that in that uh, question. I, we can go into it a little bit later and talk about it, but I'm uh, that's not particularly my approach. But it's it is my responsibility to sort of tell you that's that's generally the majority approach. Whether people are evangelical or non-evangelical doesn't really matter. Um, these days, a full 95% of New Testament scholarship believes that the, at least the synoptic gospels, the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, are derived from uh, Mark and another non-canonical source uh, designated as Q. So that's, uh, that touches on our question of Matthew. Where does Matthew get his material, the source for Matthew's gospel, again, from these two sources? Um, Matthew is structured around five discourses. Um, we have five times in uh, his gospel. I've given, given you here uh, Matthew 7, 28, 11, 5, 13, 53, 19, 1, and 26, 1, uh, where we have the passage, when Jesus finished saying, these are five discourses. Uh, scholars see those as Matthew structuring his gospel, uh, perhaps to pattern after the Pentateuch or the Psalms. Um, that, that sort of is the structure uh, around which uh, Matthew builds his gospel. One of the things that Matthew is very keen on, uh, of course, is the idea of fulfillment. Uh, he will quote a, uh, an Old Testament passage and say, and this is to fulfill. Uh, and so he's very much about the business of, of understanding Jesus's life he does what he says as a fulfillment of specific uh, passages from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, um, and uh, that that is sort of an, an unusual approach to the Hebrew Bible. I will say that we have some parallels in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, we have a similar idea of what we call Pesher, uh, P-E-S-H-E-R, uh, and this is a type of commentary, a type of approach to prophetic material where they will quote an, an Old Testament passage, particularly from the prophets, and then they will say, Pishro, its interpretation is, and they will interpret that passage from the Bible in light of a contemporary event. They will see those verses being fulfilled in their day. 
Again, it's a slightly different way of expressing it. We don't necessarily have uh, Matthew using that type of verbiage, that language. Uh, but still, the idea of the fulfillment of Scripture in specific events is something that is familiar to Matthew's Gospel. Um, one other thing before we you know, discuss issues uh, more on E360 um, that are interesting things to sort of focus on, uh, we, we can't, we are a limited amount of time in terms of what we can look at each week in the particular New Testament books. So I sort of p pull out some things for us to focus on uh, to try to understand some of the content of, of the particular works. Uh, before we do, I, I would highlight the fact that, that uh, one of the things that in Matthew's gospel it seems to be quite unique to him is drawing attention to the um, sort of like you would say, Jesus as the second Moses. Um, of course, we have in Deuteronomy 18, God speaks to Moses and says, I will raise up one like you. And there were those who in the first century believed that that spoke to a future prophet, uh, a redemptive figure who would come. And uh, it seems that that may have been part of Matthew's mindset. Some of the things in his stories and the way he tells the stories seem to suggest that he's casting a parallel between uh, Jesus and Moses. Uh, the departure down into Egypt, going into Egypt, which of course Matthew, uh, which Moses does, as well as Jesus. The story of the killing of the innocents, and then of course the, the idea of the attempt to kill the infants in, uh, the, in, uh, in the story related to Moses as well. Uh, the, the the presentation of, of Jesus always sitting on the mountain speaking. There's sort of a mountain motif in Matthew's gospel where you'll have uh, the similar story of, uh, of, let's say, Luke. We have in Matthew, we have the Sermon on the Mount. And in Luke, we have the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, Matthew seems to always, from sort of the beginning to end, has these mosaic uh, mo motifs that run through his gospel. Seems that perhaps he's trying to underscore this idea of Jesus being the second Moses. Uh, moving on to that, as we look at the message of, of, uh, of Jesus and the uh, his preaching his proclamation uh, you can't avoid the the figure of John the Baptist uh, John is a strategic figure in the telling of the gospel uh, all four gospels began with uh, with John the Baptist uh, and his ministry they described them slightly different uh, but with strong similarities all four gospels relate John to the passage in Isaiah 40 chapter 3 a voice crying in the wilderness uh, prepare ye the way of the Lord and um, they all present John involved in a ritual immersion work it's uh, slightly unusual in terms of the, the, the practice of ritual immersion is not unusual but John's function and his what seems to the centrality it seems to have in John's work and his ministry is a bit unusual. Um, so we, we want to talk a little bit about John's message because Jesus comes out of that. He complements John's message. And sometimes if we don't understand what John is anticipating, we can miss what Jesus is uh, saying in response to that. Again, we get the description, uh, I think the best description of John's location, uh, which for me is an important point. Uh, those of you who don't know, I'm an historical geographer. I deal a lot with the physical aspects of the story, and I've written several atlases. And so for me, the, the physical aspects, where these things take place, uh, because sometimes where they take place also shape the events themselves and how they're understood by the ancient peoples who experienced them. Uh, so the question of where John was located for me is an important one. 
the other thing is the content of his message. Uh, we hear in, in Luke chapter 3, 23, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So that's the first clue. We need to be looking for a place called wilderness. Uh, and he went to all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The two geographical elements there are the wilderness and the regions of the Jordan. Uh, that, that really touches on the question of us trying to locate where John was involved in his, his ministry that included ritual immersion. Um, and then his message was one of uh, baptism for repentance, or I should say repentance that's, that's signaled by baptism uh, with the aim of accomplishing the remission of sins. Uh, these are not as uh, simple as we might think at first glance. Uh, first, I want to take a quick look at John's, uh, uh, his, uh, the location of John. Uh, this is, the map is a little small. I apologize for that. This gives you a, an idea of the, the map of the sea, uh, the land of Judea. You can see the Sea of Galilee there to the north, and then in the south, the Dead Sea. Uh, the Sea of Galilee stretches all the way from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. What most people don't realize, though, is that the, the Jordan River actually extends north of the Sea of Galilee as well. Christian tradition has placed John down near the Dead Sea. Uh, that is tradition that's not heard before the Byzantine period. It's not a very early tradition. Uh, when we look at the descriptions in the Gospels about where John was baptizing, it just speaks of his uh, ministering in a wilderness, and it says he's in the regions of the Jordan. Uh, that's a fairly broad description, sort of in the area of the Jordan, not even necessarily baptizing in the Jordan. Um, the other part that is uh, is instructive, it comes out of John's gospel, not in the synoptics, is the description that he's baptizing in Bethany beyond the Jordan. Um, in the south, there is no Bethany beyond the Jordan. There's nothing here to the south. Bethany beyond the Jordan is actually the Greek name for the hill country of the Bashan. Uh, today we would refer to as the Golan Heights. Uh, which comes right down to the Jordan River. Uh, so it's, and it is beyond the Jordan. It's to the east side. It's in the Trans Jordan. Uh, in, my, in my view, all of the elements that we have regarding John seem to fit the proximity just north of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, in fact, according to John's Gospel, the day after Jesus is baptized, uh, two of his followers came out of uh, uh, Bethsaida, which, by the way, is where we're excavating. Uh, Nayak is involved in excavations, and followed Jesus. Uh, that's right where the, sea, uh, the Jordan River flows into the Sea of Galilee, right at the very top. And so everything about the story of John has a more northern feel. Uh, one more quick point just to... Uh, sort of again reinforce that because generally people will always speak of some place south of the Sea of Galilee along here. Uh, the problem with that is that the, the waters south of the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan, uh, there were tributaries coming in from east, from west, uh, and they sometimes came from suspicious origins. And so uh, the sages deemed that the waters south of the Sea of Galilee were not fit for ritual immersion. Uh, they were not, but actually what it says in Hebrew is that they're not kosher, uh, but they're not suitable for ritual immersion. For that and other reasons, uh, I would suggest that John may have been a little bit farther north than, than we generally think. Uh, doesn't mean he has to be in any one place. He can move around, of course, but I, I tend to view John as appearing farther north. 
I think more important for us, for most of us, is the question of, of his uh, ministry. We hear about a repentance uh, for the remission of sins. And again, it's the, the act of baptism is not extraordinary in Jewish practice. It goes on to this day. Uh, it's a regular occurrence that takes place, uh, and it, but it has to do with issues of purity, ritual purity. These are based upon the Levitical laws, something that most of us don't know much about, and that's because most of us are not Jewish, and so these laws don't pertain to us. The laws of ritual purity only pertain to members of the people of Israel. And so um, as Christianity grew and sort of moved out beyond its Jewish context, and you have more and more of the Gentile church, the issues of ritual purity are not have no relevance. So we really don't hear much about them. Uh, but again, this is before that point, and, and, and this is a fully Jewish context. Uh, and we have John preaching uh, re repentance and asking people to signal that repentance by ritual immersion uh, for the aim of accomplishing the remission of sins. Very interesting wording, the idea of remission. This is jubilee language. Uh, many people don't realize that in the first century there, was, there were people with expectations that redemption, uh, salvation, liberation, would come in a jubilee year. Uh, this is sort of the mindset of people who are find themselves in a situation where life is beyond their control. Usually there's suffering or persecution. Uh, in that environment, this, this view that basically God is, is in control more than we can imagine, such that not only will he accomplish the things that he desires to accomplish, but they will, they will happen at the time he determines and that he's in such control of history that they happen in jubilee years. Uh, there's actually a 2nd century BC work called the Book of Jubilees. It's a retelling of Gen the Book of Genesis in the first 12 chapters of Exodus. And interestingly enough, everything that happened, every major event happens in a jubilee year. And again, we can sort of look at it, we can chuckle, but we have to understand what the mindset is and what they're trying to say to us. What they're trying to say to us is that God is in complete control. His sovereignty is such that not only are, are the acts in history his will, but he'll even, he even times them according to his will. And so they, they had this expectation that the Redeemer would come in a jubilee year and would bring redemption, bring salvation to to the nation. And of course, these are built around a very creative spiritual reading of the Jubilee, description of the Jubilee in uh, the Hebrew Bible. Two places, Deuteronomy 15 and Leviticus 25. Uh, I've given you here the passage from Leviticus 25. And you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of seven weeks of years shall be to you forty-nine. Then you shall ascend abroad the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. That's very interesting, that, that description, is that the Jubilee doesn't begin on the first day of the new year. And again, you're not used to figure, uh, the Jewish calendar, but basically uh, the first, we everybody generally knows Rosh Hashanah or Rosh Hashanah. You might pronounce it. Um, that's the first day of the seven, seventh month. Instead, it starts, the Jubilee starts on the tenth day of the seventh month. That is, as it says here, the Day of Atonement. Fascinating. The Jubilee begins on the Day of Atonement. And you shall send abroad the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his own land and each of you shall return to his family. Now imagine if you're living in the first century, you see yourself living under military occupation by Rome 
and you're looking for liberation, you're looking for salvation, you're looking for God to send a hero, a, a redeemer figure, and the present sufferings of the nations, the, the, the sufferings that are going on today, are viewed as a consequence of the sin of the nation. Not just individual sin, but collective, national sin. And your belief that salvation will come when God atones for the sins of the nation. And he wipes the slate clean and sends the Redeemer. Liberty is proclaimed. You return to your land. You've been, uh, you know, you've been removed. It's been seized, perhaps. Uh, these things all take place. Uh, you have, if you read the Dennis, uh, Deuteronomy 15 chapter, it speaks of the forgiving of debts. And in first century jargon, the word debts was a metaphor for sin. Remember the Lord's Prayer. One Lord's Prayer in Luke says, Forgive us our trespasses. What it, how does it read in Matthew? Forgive us our debts. And again, the language of debt was, was read as interpreted and sort of spiritualized as the language of sin. So the, the, the large picture is that there were people in the first century, I think John was among them, who believed that God would send his Messiah, his Redeemer, in a jubilee year when he would forgive the nation. I, sh I should probably reverse the order of that. That God would forgive the sins of the nation and as a consequence send his Redeemer Messiah to bring liberty, freedom, salvation to the nation. So these are, these are ideas that are embedded in the Jubilee and, and find their way in the spiritual and redemptive aspirations of, of the people of Israel in the first century. Um, I think, again, I think John was part of that. Uh, this look for redemption, the expectations of, of what, uh, what God would do on behalf of his people. However, as we know, we get to the end of John's life, uh, Jesus and John are at odds. When you read Matthew chapter 11, and I know that, that John identifies Jesus as Messiah uh, in all the Gospels, no question about that. But when we get to the end of John's life, if you open up and you read Matthew chapter 11, John is in prison. Uh, he's been in prison because he's spoken out against uh, Herod Antipas. Sometimes we miss the reason for his criticism. Uh, people try to find some kind of Old Testament law that forbids you from, from marrying your brother's wife. That's not the case at all. Josephus actually gives us the more racy version of what actually happened. Um, Antipas had gone to Rome and on his way stayed with uh, his stepbrother, his, his half-brother and his wife, who was Herodias. And he had fallen in love with Herodias, had a, an, an adulterous affair with her. Um, Antipas was already married to an Abbotean princess. And he, anyhow, he had an affair with Herodias, and he actually proposed marriage to her while he was still married. Um, and she, she said she would, but only on the grounds that he would divorce his wife. So both um, Herod Antipas and Herodias uh, divorce their spouses in order to legitimize an adulterous affair. And in Judaism, you can, you can get divorced, you can get remarried without any lasting stigma. But the one thing that you are not allowed to do is if there is a third party, someone who's involved causing the breakdown of the marriage, uh, then you are forbidden to marry that individual, uh, the home wrecker, as it were. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, Herod Antipas does. John speaks out about it. Herod Antipas is concerned that this will get out of hand because of the large crowds that are following John. And um, so he has John imprisoned. And while John is in prison, he sends a message to Jesus saying, 
Are you the one who is to come, or is there another? Now, there's clearly doubt in John's voice. Uh, there is uncertainty uh, in his question, and that has to do with his expectations. The language that he uses, are you the one who is to come, sounds very similar to the message of his preaching when he says, there is one coming after me. Uh, and Again, in all the Gospels, we encounter that language. That language of the coming one is drawn from both Malachi 3, uh, where we hear about a one who is coming, uh, who is a prophet of judgment, uh, and then, and not only just a prophet, but one who actually brings judgment and punishment, as well as uh, Daniel uh, 7.13, where we hear about the Son of Man, the one who comes. And in Daniel's writing, the Son of Man is the figure who executes God's judgment. So in essence, what, what uh, John is asking Jesus, are you the one who is to come and punish the wicked and rescue, vindicate the righteous? And he might have, you know, added in parentheses, if you are, you need to get after it because I'm getting ready to have my head cut off by the wicked. So it's, it's a pressing question for him. This is not a theoretical, philosophical question. This is a question that has very personal consequences for John. So he sends messengers to ask Jesus are you the one who is to come, i.e. to bring judgment, or not? Did I make a mistake? And Jesus' answer there in those verses in the opening of Matthew chapter 11, it essentially is a, it says, yes, I am. He, he alludes to a number of Old Testament passages there. Um, and, he, and, and all those passages are associated very closely with, with messianic expectations. So, in essence, Jesus is saying, yes, I am. How, however, it will not unfold as you expect. Uh, in other words, Jesus was not going to follow right after John's expectations. Jesus had his own understanding of what the Father intended. And so, he cautions him at the end, uh, the best translation I would give to that would be to say, blessed is he who is not mistaken about me. So he cautions Matthew not to uh, draw any uh, wrong conclusions by this being drawn out. And of course, we know the end of the story that, that John, is he dies. Um, and this is sort of the essence that 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 crisis, that question and answer in Matthew chapter 11 sort of brings into clear relief uh, what Flusser writes about in the chapter that I had you read on the stages of redemption. I've drawn a little, um, perhaps made it a little bit more clearly here, clear here in terms of these expectations. Um, the, I can say that the older expectation is what we could say is a two-part stage of redemption, or Flusser calls it a bipartite state of uh, redemption, and that is that the present age carries forward until the Messiah, the Redeemer, comes, and then we're at the end. In Hebrew, the Akrita Yamim, the end of days. Uh, there's no hesitation, and with that comes the uh, things that one expects at the end, punishment, resurrection, uh, the vindication of the righteous, punishment of the wicked, uh, all of those things happen at the end with the coming of the Messiah. He is the instrument of judgment. And again, that is uh, probably the older idea, has its roots already in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, but we have a second one, which is a, uh, an innovation, uh, that belongs more to the thinking of the rabbis, and I would suggest also Jesus. And that is, there is a three-part stage of redemption. 
Again, you have the present age. With the coming of the Messiah, we enter into the Messianic age. Uh, in Hebrew, Yamot Mashiach, the days of the Messiah. Uh, and then, so it's an intermediate age, a, a middle era, middle age. Uh, and then, at another point, we have the end with all of the things that one expects. One expects to see the judgment and resurrection and all of those things that come at the end. But between them is this intermediate period uh, that's not yet the end. Um, and that seems to be Jesus's understanding of what's happening in his day. Um, and what's novel, what's creative on Jesus's part is that he's the only one who uses another term another very well-known term, but he uses this term to describe this middle age. He uses the term, the kingdom of heaven, Malchut Shemayim in Hebrew, uh, for this middle age. And that is, uh, again, that's not something that we can go out and find two, three, four other people in his time doing this. This seems to be part of Jesus's creative genius uh, and designating the, this period that is focused on his ministry, that something new has happened, that God is working in a dramatically new way, that God is working redemptively in the world, that, that, that we, we are living in a time of God's uh, increased activity. Uh, Jesus says, if I cast out this demon by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus has a very clear understanding of the immediacy of the kingdom that is a present reality, uh, and, and it has a specific point in history. Um, and he, and it, it, is, it lies between you know, what came earlier and the end. Um, he uses the language we have here in Matthew eleven twelve From the days of John until now, the kingdom of heaven has forcefully advanced. Uh, actually, the, the verbiage, the language here is exploding. It's breaking forth. It's a very dynamic description that Jesus gives here. Um, and, this, and again, this tension that we see, uh, Jesus actually addresses it sometimes. Uh, you may know the parable of the, um, uh, with the seeds, the wheat and the tares. The bringing of the, at night, the, the enemy brings and sows the tares, the weeds within the wheat. And when those who see them together, uh, they're sort of shocked and they want to pull out the wheat already. And, and the owner says, no, don't do that. You might damage the wheat. Wait. And that, that is sort of this tension that exists. Uh, in fact, probably it is a rebuttal to John himself because it's using a lot of this, uh, the language that we find of John. John uses the language of wheat uh, and fire and all those things. He's using the metaphors of John, Jesus says, to sort of re, re, to answer him, to suggest that uh, this is not the time for pulling out the, the weeds. There is a time. There will be a time of separation. There will be a time of burning, of punishment, but that's not now. So we pick this up on several occasions that we, we, we hear of uh, this sort of tension that exists. Again, these two expectations. In a couple of weeks' time, we're going to talk about Jesus in, Naz in the Nazareth synagogue. I think it's important because uh, that episode in Luke 4 is Jesus' first public statement. And in very real ways, it is an answer to John's expectation. John is expecting uh, the redemption to come in a jubilee year. Uh, and you, you remember that some of the language of that, of a year of liberty, is uh, that actually is something that we hear part of Jesus's uh, reading when he reads Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Uh, the, the proclamation of liberty, of freedom. So Jesus picks that passage. Uh, that wasn't appointed to him. He actually had the freedom 
to select that passage. And it seems to be to complement John's expectations. It's Jesus' way of saying, it has happened. It is here. It is now. Now, as we know in Nazareth, it ends up being quite a, a tense moment because Jesus challenges some of their expectations of what redemption looks like. But again, that, that'll be a subject for another week. So as we move forward, again, I want to remind you um, that when you look at the material this week, uh, please make sure that you do the discussion questions that show up in E360. Uh, they count towards your um, final grade. There are 50, if you look at the syllabus, everyone should look at the syllabus. 50% of your uh, grade is, is made up of either discussion questions or uh, the weekly quizzes. I repeat, the weekly quizzes will be over the content from the uh, content from the Jewish annotated New Testament. So you're only talking about two or three pages that you have to read well, understand, and sort of retain uh, a memory of what's there. So it's it, and it's not made to be tricky. It's just to make sure that you read it. Uh, the other part, which is very very important, is reading is doing the discussion questions. Um, it's very easy to fulfill the requirements of this course if you do this. And, and I, I will be repeating it week after week, but trust me, there will be a number of you who will choose to do nothing. And, and that this is what you're required to do. You're given a discussion question or two during the week, and you're to read the question. Sometimes that question is related to a short reading, few pages, an article or something, and there'll be a discussion question on it. Um, and you're given a question which you're asked to respond to directly. You should answer that question directly and then twice to your colleagues. So, and, and something more than I agree with you. Tell me why you agree with them. The, the, the point is, is to have a, a community, a discussion in the, with the individuals in this course. Uh, and again, you're, I'm not asking you to write a dissertation. Uh, you're not graded primarily on the content, although if you push the envelope, that, that subject will come up. Uh, I'm more interested in the fact that you do it that you actually read the discussion question, that you answer it directly yourself, and that you take the time to respond twice, only twice. I would say on the whole, each week, we're talking about 15 minutes of work. Uh, it's the easiest way I know for you to um, get full credit. I mean full credit. So that half of your grade if you, you, know, you really work on these two points, the discussion question and the weekly quizzes, half of your grade can be 100% or close to it. Uh, again, it's, a, um, it's very simple. The other two things that uh, are, uh, are in your hands are the um, involvement with the, the reviews. You're going to have two book reviews. Uh, one is the Sage from Galilee. The second is... Uh, Paul, the Jewish theologian. Again, those are on your syllabus. Uh, they're fifteen percent of your grade for each one of those. So you're you're pretty much your your the co composition of your course will be uh, those assignments. There's a couple of additional things that we'll take up a little bit later on. But I want to encourage all of you. It's the it's the easiest part of the course. It's and it's the easiest way to get full credit. People are always coming to me at the end of the semester, what can I do for extra credit, what can I do? And usually it's because they chose not to do the easiest thing for the entire semester. So I would just strongly encourage you, be involved in the discussion questions and spend, spend a few minutes, sit down 20 minutes, 30 minutes, read the two or three pages. Uh, you can access that either you have, you can purchase the Jewish Annotated New Testament yourself um, this is just a regular New Testament. It's revi new Revised Standard Version, so it's not a Jewish version. Uh, but what it has is it has uh, introductions written by 
well-known, renowned Jewish scholars uh, in, in the beginning of each one of the works in the New Testament. Provides a little bit of an introduction. And then there are useful articles in it as well. It's a nice volume to have. I will say that the, the volume does exist in our uh, Nyack Library collection as a digital volume. Now I need to plead with you, do not check it out. Go online, read it, uh, but do not check it out. Again, we're only talking about a couple of pages, but if you check it out, uh, then there are about 100 students who can't access it, so who are in my class and are using it. So uh, I, I want to underscore and emphasize it. Do not check it out online. Uh, just go on, find the little section that you need to read in the NIAC uh, digital volumes and read it, you know, and then uh, and be done with it and, and let it, back, you know, put it back and let somebody else have their opportunity to read it as well. Uh, one final thing is please do not wait to the end of the, um, the week. Uh, you'll see that there's a specified deadline for the uh, for the discussion questions and the exams. That's usually the night before class. Uh, and if you're in the online class, that has uh, that's that would be on Tuesday evening at midnight. Uh, do not wait to to do all of this on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock because I'll promise you at some point in this semester, something will go wrong, something will happen, and you will not, you'll be locked out, something will go amiss, miss. it always happens. Uh, do not do that. Uh, do it earlier. Uh, your test you have to take in the 24 hour period. So, but do it earlier in the day in case something pops up, let me know, we'll get IT on it, whatever. But if you wait to the last minute and, and you get shut out, there's nothing I can do about it. And I can't allow any extensions. There will be no extensions, no exceptions, period, on any of work. All the deadlines are firm without a single exception. Um, so you, you have plenty of time to get this done. It's not that much work. So it, But if you, invite, you want to invite disaster, then wait till the end. So... Uh, you have the material. Um, have a great week, and I'll look forward to being in touch with you next week. Good night.